Let's get started with today's devotion. And it's a little bit longer just because the passage we're doing longer. It's Matthew chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 30. And let me read those first few verses and get us going. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who was baptizing, but his disciples. And we made reference to that yesterday. So he left Judea and went back once again, uh, once more to Galilee. So Jesus' early ministry in the region of Judea, which is closer to Jerusalem, was gaining increasing attention. And because there were so many followers of Jesus, it got the curiosity of the Pharisees. And they were the ruling religious class at that time. And the growth of any kind of messianic movement could clearly be misinterpreted as having political overtones and wanting to overthrow the Romans and the religious establishment did not want that violence. And uh, Jesus did not want to get involved in any kind of conflict between the state, whether it was the Jewish government or the Roman government. So in order to avoid a clash, uh, he left Judea and journeyed back northward to Galilee. So let's read those next verses now. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Okay, so the shortest route from Judea to Galilee, but not the only way, was to go through Samaria. The other route was to kind of go out of your way on the east side of the Jordan River. And I actually pulled up a map for that. So I know some of you might be on a phone. You can't see that real well. Uh, it's small, even on a computer screen. But you can see here exactly what's going on. Jesus had been in Judea and uh, had been actually also in Jerusalem some. And the, the best way to go back would be to go straight from Jerusalem through Samaria, and here's Sychar, all the way back to Galilee where Nazareth was and Canaan was. But a lot of times the Jews did not want to go through Samaria because the Jews hated the Samaritans. So they would go out of the way as much as they could and then come back just a little bit here to get back into Nazareth. And remember, Samaria in the, in the New Testament time describes this middle part uh, of what is uh, modern day Israel, what is, uh, what is pal called Palestine sometimes. And there was no independent government here. Here in Ju Judea, there was still a, a, a Jewish government, but the Romans were in charge of all of this. And remember, there was that hostility because the people in Samaria had basically a mixed religious background and a mixed ethnic background. Those were those northern tribes that the Assyrians had conquered, and they had brought people in from other parts of the world and took the, the Israelites that were there and moved them to other parts of their empire. And so they kind of mixed together their religious beliefs with paganism and Judaism. And the, the religion was so different from biblical uh, Judaism uh, that the, the Jews just didn't send them to be really children of God anymore. So there was this hostility between the two. And, and going through there was just thought as not as something you wanted to do. And the center of the earl worship was in Mount Gerizim, which was near here, Sychar here. Well, anyway, well, it's interesting. There's actually a small group of Samaritans still in Israel today in, in maintaining the traditions. But, but the point here is, is that Jesus could have gone this way, which most Jews did, but he chose to go this way. And notice the passage said he had to. Now, he didn't have to for practical reasons. He really, for practical reasons, could have gone a different way. But he had to for spiritual reasons. He had to in order to reach the despised people in that region and to proclaim the fact that he was the savior of the entire world, just not Jewish people, that he saves even those that were despised and considered outcasts by the Jews. Well, like I said, Jacob's well lies at the foot of Mount Gezer Gerizim, which was the center of a Samaritan worship. And it's one of those places where you can still kind of know where it was at today because of Jacob's well. It was, it's still there. Why was a Samaritan woman there at noon? Now, some of you know the Bible. You know there's some speculation about why she should be there at noon because that was not the time women would, would normally come and get water. That was the hottest time of the day. You'd come in the morning or in the evening when it was cooler. So maybe she just really needed water really badly then. Or maybe she didn't care to meet the other women of the community. And as we'll see, because of her general character, she was probably shunned and maybe even bullied some by the other women there. 
So she probably was surprised even to see a man sitting at the well because it was the hottest part of the day. And she was probably doubly surprised when she found out this man was a Jew. And Jesus' initial approach was simply a request for water, which he presumed would get a favorable response. It's kind of hard to say no to someone who's wanting some water in the, the heat of the day. Um, the request maybe didn't surprise her, but what really would have surprised her was the fact that it came from a man, came from a Jewish man, and came from a Jewish rabbi. Because normally a Jew would not want to drink from a Samaritan's cup because they would think that would make them ceremonially unclean. All right, let's get back to the, the story there. Um, you know, that's why she asked that question. Uh, well, he asked that question uh, from, of her because he wanted some water. Verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would ask him and he would have given you living water. Now, there's actually a bit of sarcasm in the woman's reply. It's kind of like she meant this. We Samaritans are dirt under your feet until you want something and then we're good enough. You know, how is it you want this from me? And you usually won't treat us very good at all. But Jesus did not pay any attention to her flippant response or even the bitterness was there. He was more concerned with the woman and women, winning the woman to him than he was about winning some argument. So he wanted to arouse her curiosity by that phrase, if you knew. He implied that because of his nature as a person, he could bestow on her a gift of God that would be greater than any ordinary water. And this illusion was kind of intent to raise her level of thinking from just the material things to the spiritual reality. However, the woman doesn't catch on so quick. So look, look at her response in verse 11. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and this well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again. But whatever drinks the water I can give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Well, the woman hears Jesus' words, but he, she obviously misses his meaning. Living water to her really meant just fresh spring water, which this well was actually a spring-fed well, so the water there was good. But she really did not grasp the fact that Jesus was talking about something other than physical water. He was talking about a spiritual water that can satisfy the soul, not just the body. Now, basically, her response was appropriate for someone who really had their comprehension and luck out in life simply tied to this earth and to material things. Uh, and besides, you know, that was a deep well. You talk about where are you going to do this? That well today is 75 feet deep. Think about having to have a rope 75 feet deep to go down and draw up a bucket of water. Well, the woman also makes a reference to our father, Jacob. And she's basically saying, I know you Jews don't think that we're part of the Israelite bloodline. But remember, we can trace our lineage all the way back to Jacob. And she was aware of the low esteem that the uh, Jews held them in but she wanted to kind of set the record straight. We're just as good as you Jews are. But Jesus wasn't wanting to get off in any of those kind of side issues. He wanted to make the point that what he was talking about was not water from a physical well, that it was better than that. It was not water that just would temporarily relieve your physical thirst. It was spiritual water that would quench the inner thirst forever. And that water down there, you know, would be a hard labor to get up, but the spiritual water that's going to bubble up from in is, is not something we do or achieve on our own. It's something that God gives us. But because of her kind of non-spiritual perspective and her own interests, uh, she was not really, really into that. She just wanted to not have to make that long trip from the village to the well. So she got, makes her request, give me the water. And Jesus is ready to kind of help her really understand he's not talking about physical water. But notice what he does first in verse 16. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, the woman replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What, have you, what you just said is quite true. 
Sir, the woman said, I can see you're a prophet. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Well, Jesus did not respond basically directly to her quest about, about give me this water. He wanted to understand some things more. So he told her to go and get her husband and come back. Now, Jesus' request was both proper and strategic. It was proper because it really wasn't good etiquette for a man to talk to a woman unless her husband was present. It was strategic because he wanted to help her focus on what her real need was rather than just get focused on, bio, on physical water. She had no husband that she could call, and she really didn't want to get into her uh, sexual irregularities with a stranger. So she just basically says she has no husband kind of uh, abruptly. Um, but Jesus wants to continue the discussion of her life and relationship with men because this pointed to her spiritual need. Now, although there's sin in her life, I'm not going to deny that, Jesus is not here primarily wanting to talk to her to create a sense of guilt. He's actually wanting more to uh, confront the pain that she's had in her relationships with men. And this would really should really accentuate her thirst for a meaningful relationship with God, a relationship that she's not going to get with a husband, no matter how wonderful that husband is, and to help her understand what Jesus was actually offering her so she could be open to receiving that. And really what's striking here is not so much the number of husbands or lovers this woman lived with, nor even the man that she was now with who was her husband. What's striking here is Jesus' supernatural knowledge of her personal life. Now, she realized this, and she says this guy has supernatural knowledge. She calls him a prophet, but she doesn't want to deal with her issue. She wants to shift it to just talking about spiritual things. She was uncomfortable about dealing with what this meant for her personally and wanted to argue religious issues. All right, where should we worship? Here in Mount Gerizim, where we Samaritan thinks okay, or the Jews where you guys say okay, where, where Solomon built his temple? Well, Jesus is not going to be distracted. Look what he does in verse 21. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when we'll worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kinds of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit. His worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So notice Jesus is wanting to avoid an argument about the location that people should gather for worship. He does not make any concession saying that Samaritan worship is equal to Jewish worship. No, he says they worship what they don't know. But what he wants to make the point is there's something more important. And that is the time has come when all true worshipers are not going to worry about going to Jerusalem or going to Mount Gerizim. They're going to focus on Jesus because it's Jesus' death and resurrection and his spend, sending the spirit will usher in a whole new way of worship. And Jesus could say it's coming and has now come because he is there teaching and preaching the kingdom of God and setting things in, worship, in motion. He's now setting up new worship, which is in spirit and in truth. And true worship that is in spirit means that the worshiper must deal honestly and openly directly with God as a person, not just as the object of religious rituals. That God wants to know us and be close to us. He wants to come into our life and be part of our lives. He does not want to be thought of as something that's in a building someplace. He doesn't want to be thought of as being an idol. He doesn't want to be thought of one who you just simply please by engaging some rituals. He's one that we know and we have a relationship. So it's in spirit. And she's got to open her heart to God. And she's right now, Jesus is pressing her, but she's a little bit, a little bit resistance. So God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. It's interesting. And we're going to look at some of the I am statements about Jesus. But when you look in the New Testament, you get these descriptions. God is spirit. God is light. God is love. God is a consuming fire. So he wants to not get sidetracked with these things. He wants her to know that God has basically been made known in Jesus, that the spirit is how you approach him, but you also need truth. And that truth comes from the person of Jesus, who not only was sent to be the, the, the teacher, but he was also sent to be the essence of our faith. So what we need to do is to approach God with sincerity as person, and we need to approach him understanding that Jesus paid for our sins and we have faith in Jesus and that we're ready to live our lives in accordance with the teachings of Jesus. 
Well, the conversation, um, oh gosh, I, I just, I jumped ahead here uh, a little bit because um, she also makes these, these statements here about this, um, that uh, the woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he'll explain all this to, to us. Then Jesus replied, I am the one speaking to you. So this, th he's finally got her to the point of where, where she could really put her faith and trust in him. And, and, and he can go in a little bit deeper about exactly who he is and, and what happens. Well, just then the disciples returned and they were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked him, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? So they came out of town and made their way toward him. So remember, the disciples had left Jesus at the well to rest. They had gone into town to get some food and they came back and they are surprised he's talking with the women, with a woman. Now, we know that's a violation of custom, right? Men didn't talk to women in public if they weren't like family members, but they respected him. So they didn't want to question his behavior and say, why are you talking to a woman? Jesus' attitude toward women was different than that of his disciples. He initiated this long, meaningful conversation with a Samaritan woman, not just a woman, a Samaritan woman in public, unconcerned about other people's prejudice or thoughts. Now, she left. We don't know why all of a sudden she left. She maybe sensed the negative attitude of the disciples toward her, but notice she left her water jar and went back into town. Now, why'd she leave her water pot there? Well, maybe she was there so Jesus could get the drink she requested. Maybe she left it because she was in a hurry to get back on town. But she might have left it only because she was planning to come back. She wasn't completely put off by disciples. What she does is she goes back into town because she wants to tell other people who she's found. She's found this man who told her everything she ever did. It means he had this supernatural insight. Could this be the Messiah? Now, what's amazing is what this woman did was really strange in that culture. You know, she went into public as a woman and started talking with men and saying, hey, you guys need to come out here and check this guy out. And, and not just she did that. She did that with her past reputation, that town. She was so excited about meeting somebody who she thought was the Christ that she wanted to share it with somebody else. Now, it started off with her just saying, this is a guy talking to me and he's nice. So I'll talk to him some more too. He's a prophet. And then she finally saw who was the Christ. And her question there, could this be the Christ? It's not really a question. It's basically her saying, he is the Christ. Come out and check him out. Because when you check him out, you're going to see he's somebody special. He has knowledge that only could be from the one who is the Messiah. Well, this is how the section concludes. Uh, she goes into town. She calls them out. Verse 30, they came out of town and made their way toward him. But exactly what happens there? Well, we're not going to find out tomorrow because this is all the time we had for today. But I think what we really see here is Jesus and ministering to this woman, how he did not let prejudice keep him from talking to people. He did not let the ethnic prejudice of hatred between Samaritans and Jews keep him from talking to people. We should not let any ethnic racial distance keep us from loving and talking to people and sharing our faith with people. We shouldn't even let reputations about people being a moral person or an immoral person. Sometimes we think somebody who's, who's not really um, very moral in their life, oh, they're not going to be interested in Jesus. Well, those are the people that need to Jesus the most. They're the ones that have the need in their life and maybe the very people who are most open to him. So let's be like Jesus and think everybody needs to hear the good news of Jesus. But also notice what Jesus did. Although it was still just a few hours together, a brief time together, he started where she was at. All she was thinking about were physical things. So he started there and then gradually moved her along to open her heart more to her spiritual need and the fact that Jesus, the living water, could meet her need. And we need to do the same thing. Now, in our life, it's probably going to be longer. We're not going to always have those conversations where we can go from the, the beginning point to the end point right away. But as we build relationships with people, we can move them along in their spiritual journey so they can go from people who are far from God to people who are close to God and put their faith in Jesus and receive all the blessings and benefits that come from salvation as well. So in this passage, Jesus gave us a great example of how we should interact with people and how we should think everybody is loved and valued by God. And so we should reach out to everybody that we come in contact with. Let me pray. 
Father, first of all, we thank you that you are a loving and gracious God, and you don't come just for the righteous because there's no one who's truly righteous in your eyes. You don't come to those who uh, practice religion the right way and, and, and follow you the right way. You come to those that don't. Jesus said he came to seek and to save the lost, and so help us to also think about it. Not just think about, oh, somebody I know goes to church. Maybe I can get them to come to my church. No, that's not what we're about. We're about helping people who are far from you come close to you and have that saving relationship with you. So, Father, we're thankful for that. And we're thankful that people did that for us. That We didn't start off right with you, but we needed people to show us and guide us and direct us. Some of us were fortunate enough to go into Christian homes where they were taught and raised early. Others didn't have that experience. But you love us all and you reach out to all and help us to do the same thing. Father, we're thankful for your grace and mercy. We're thankful for this new day of life. Uh, we look forward to what you will do in our lives today. We look forward to your protection, your peace, your guidance. And we pray that you will be with us and use us today. In Jesus' name, amen.